sands and rocks on which it hits. Surfers and boarders take advantage of this energy and ride it, a free ride, without the electricity requirements, entrance fees, or lines of the more standard amusement parks, and no closing times. In some parts of the world, this wave energy is harnessed and used to produce electricity for the local town and industry. However, as wave energy changes throughout the day and year, it cannot provide a consistent flow, and is most useful when there is an effective way to store it when it exists in high amounts for use on the calm days. Some waves, called chop or sea, are produced by waves locally, but most of the waves you see at a beach, called swell, are coming from winds and far distant storms. that cause waves, the generating force and the restoring force. we have 
have to wait after one wave has hit the shore until the next one comes is 12 hours and 25 minutes or 24 hours and 50 minutes, which are the periods of tidal waves. will continue moving back and forth. In fact, because the waves are confined to a limited space, they create a standing wave. In the oceans, we call these standing waves seshus, and they can typically be found in small basins and pavements or waves. This image from Lake Geneva in Switzerland shows a sesh that is a regular feature here due to local wind patterns. The results of these sesh are very similar to the results produced by young kids creating standing waves in bathtubs. Water sloshes up and over the basin and floods the surrounding areas. The largest standing wave in the world's oceans are the tidal waves, as their generating force, the difference in gravitational forces experienced in different parts of the Earth for the moon and the sun, never ceases, and they are confined to Everything that is in the water will move in this circular orbit, including seaweed that sits above the wave base. 
many different locations approaching the beach on any given day at the same time. However, in this picture of Pacifica, California, we can see a regular set of waves called swell that seem to be coming from one direction. The period of these waves is probably around 10 seconds. That means every 10 seconds you can hear a wave crash on the beach, or if you wait one minute you should expect to experience six waves. Where are these waves coming from? There's no local wind producing them. However, thousands of miles away there is a storm system, perhaps a hurricane, perhaps a winter storm, and the waves that are kicked up in that area are called chop or sea. When they propagate outward from that storm area, they separate into regular sets of wave trains, all waves within which have the same height, wavelength, and period. These ordered groups or sets are called swell, and they travel thousands of miles to our beaches. What happens to them when they arrive? To answer that, we have to review a few more concepts. Let's talk first about wave speed. Like the more commonly known speed we associate with our cars on the highway, speed is simply distance over time. For a wave, the distance it travels in a given unit of time is its wavelength over its period. For example, tsunami have an average wavelength of 200 kilometers and an average period of 15 minutes. When we divide those numbers, we get an average speed of a tsunami of 800 kilometers per hour. That's how fast the energy of a tsunami wave travels across the ocean. Swell that approach our beach tend to move at speeds more like 33 kilometers per hour. However, that speed will slow once the wave feels bottom, which means once it enters water shallower than its wave base. This image reviews the wave base as the limit of orbital motion below a wave. We call waves that move through water deeper than their wave base deep water waves. Note that this definition has nothing to do with whether we think the water is deep or shallow, but only if the wave does. If the wave's base is above the seafloor, it feels like deep water, and there's no interaction between the wave and the seafloor. Once a wave enters water that is shallower than its wave base, it now transfers its orbital motion to the rock or sediment on the seafloor. That transfer of energy will pick up and move sediment, erode rock, and generally cause a frictional slowing of the base of the wave. The top of the wave might still be moving at its original speed, but the base is slowing down. This causes waves to bunch up, their wavelengths decrease, grow taller, and have their circular orbits squashed into elliptical orbits. The transformation of a wave as it enters shallow water, slowing and growing taller until eventually its top crashes over in a circular motion and it breaks onto the shore. Note. While height increases and wavelength and speed both decrease as a wave approaches shore, the period stays the same. We can now return to this image from Pacifica of actual swell approaching the beach and see this transformation. Note, for purposes of this video only, if a wave is not a deep water wave, we will call it a shallow water wave. In truth, there is a term known as a transitional wave, which sits between the two. We will not make that distinction. What kind of waves are deep water waves, and what kind are shallow water waves? And can they be one at one time and another at another? Yes, of course. Remember, whether a wave is deep water or shallow water depends only on its wavelength and the depth of water it's traveling through. For example, when you blow on your coffee cup, you make capillary waves with tiny wavelengths. They do not feel bottom of the coffee cup, so they are considered deep water waves. But those same waves in a thin film of water on the ground would feel bottom they would then be classified there as shallow water waves. What about chop versus swell? In the open ocean, both chop and swell are deep water waves, but as they travel towards the shore, their wave base will hit bottom, and when it does, they become shallow water waves. Pause now. For more information and more detail, continue on to the next video in this series. Mm -hmm.